set up right there. Okay, sure. We'll get this thing started. Right now you want to? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then just walk through, uh, I wish we had someone to guide people through this one right here. Yeah, there's no cords that will trip you. <coughs> Down up. Can you go to your laptop and accept it? Yeah. Set up right Set up there. there. We'll, get, we'll this get this thing started. started. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then just walk through. through uh, uh, what the hell is that? Why am I hearing myself? Because that's not muted. Mute that. Can you go to your All right, everybody. I think we might have an audio problem here. And I'm going to try to see if we can figure it out. So Zoom side. What's up, people? You can all hear us OK? Oh, you're Mikey, muted, Mikey. You're, Mikey, you're muted. You sound good. Everybody. Everybody. I, I think we I might think have, we have. This is the problem. Why am I hearing myself? What is that? Where is that coming from? I have no idea. It's not good. See, it's not coming from no. YouTube. Video mic box desktop. Audio. Okay, go to this. Is that why? Um, so here, it's that. But could that be it? I don't think so, but try it. Do whatever you just did. What did I just do? I don't remember. Just talk? Sorry, everybody. Uh, the technical difficulties here are crazy, but uh, for some reason, I keep coming back over the speaker in this room, and we don't know why that's happening. Okay. They're saying no sound. Who has no sound? The YouTube side. Zoom is perfect for me. Yeah. Those are always the most engaging for people who aren't like already obsessed right, with right, the right. content. Right. People are, people, you know, they get a, like, uh, they have to do a distribution. So go. Well, I haven't heard myself again, though. So go to OBS. We don't know where that. YouTube still say no sound? Yeah. What's up, Cadell? Cool. Where are you from? What do you mean it says no I'm sound? It never said no sound. Where, it, where did it say no sound? Oh, you mean the person said that? Night of the world said, I hear you. We're good. We're good. All right. The YouTube side just said, actually, we're good. And so, rock and roll, people. What's up, Cadell, Matt, the big Signorelli, Ryan, and uh, Neil Cohen on the Zoom side. It's good to see you all. Um, and welcome, everyone here in the flesh in the meat space, as we've been saying. That's an internet slang term for, the, for, for being in the flesh, right? Meat as in flesh, but also meat as in meeting. There's a question as to whether you can really meet a person online, but of course you can never really meet a person once either. You have to meet and then you have to resume if you decide to, right? And that means that uh, a lot of us have met online, but now we get to actually meet each other in this sense of flesh. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting. I don't like this metaphor. Abort mission. Yeah. Um, so what's up, everybody? Uh, I am David McCarricker. I'm your host here at Theory Underground. And 
we're coming at you live from University of Vermont in a really cool space that Todd McGowan has secured for us. The title of this talk is Freedom, and I meant to put quotes around it to kind of like suspend its meaning and to call into question the way that we use this term, right? What is freedom? And so in a certain sense, we're talking about freedom, but we're also talking about boundaries or borders or limitations or negation. Uh, and we're talking about freedom in terms of uh, contradiction, negation, limitation. Uh, and in a couple of the talks, that will be related back to the actual university and the walls or boundaries that it creates. We are also going to be relating that to the idea of the professional managerial class for at least the talk coming from Nance. But also you, right, Anne? It kind of relates, right? Yeah, it's a neoliberal university that she'll be focusing on. Nance is going to be focusing on the PMC. I'll be focusing on time energy. And Todd McGowan will be focusing on the piece that is in Underground Theory, the book that I'm holding in my hand right here. This is an author. This is an early draft marked up by the editors and Marilyn Lawrence and myself. And... Todd's piece is probably, I think, one of the most, well, it feels like it's like a real academic contribution, like the kind of thing that people in academia are actually going to have to dig up and, 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 and reference. And so that's really cool because we're actually going to put out a university edition of this book once I actually, I, 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 we meant to already do this, right? It was supposed to be like three weeks ago, but ba probably by the time tour is over, it will go up. The university edition will be $400. And the only difference between it and this edition is it will have a piffy little forward by me saying, this is the newest version, so you have to spend this much money on it. And then I'll encourage all my professor friends to get their universities to order it in because it's what they all already do anyway. So, um, But I, I actually have a... And I don't know if I can actually do this. Mikey, are you actually uh, able to say anything? You've said some really cool stuff about this essay, and so I thought maybe it would be cool if you um, share a few of your thoughts in, in a, in a, as a sort of introduction. Well, well yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, I, mean, I, mean, I think, I think well, everybody here knows, knows how, much how much Todd has inspired my work. work. Um, um, so... so Personally, though, I think this is one of his best essays. And what you get here is that, I mean, this, I've told him, it's, it's, it's kind, kind of philosophical wizardry how he's, how he's able to move from, from talking about Kant, Kant Fick, to Schelling, Schelling Hegel. Hegel. Um, um, because when, when, when most people, when most, most scholars talk about German, German idealism, idealism, it's incredibly <laughs> difficult to keep straight what they're emphasizing and what they're talking about at a particular moment. And, um, it's just, it's you, just see you see Todd's, Todd's philosophical and uh, uh, exegetical, exegetical skill, skill here, here where, where, I mean, that, I mean that's, 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 that's why everybody, why everybody just, wants just wants Todd to Todd just write as many books as he can on German, German idealism, idealism because, because nobody, nobody brings, brings this level of lucidity and clarity, clarity to, to these key, key moves, moves, right? right? I think, I think that's, that's what all of us want. want when somebody's, when somebody's explaining, explaining the trajectory, the trajectory of, German of German idealism. idealism. How do, how do, what does Fichte take from Kant? What does he change? What does Schelling take from Fichte and Kant? What does he change? What does Hegel take from Kant, Fichte, Schelling? And what does he change, right? And to me, I've, I've just never seen anybody get at these developments in this trajectory of thought better than God. And so, I mean, if you're interested in German idealism, this book's this worth, book's it, worth just it just for Todd to say. Thank you, Mikey. I couldn't have said it better. And so I kind of wanted to lead with the teaser regarding Todd's piece in the book that you should definitely order from Amazon or if you want to save a few dollars and you live in the United States, theory-underground.com forward slash store, where you get it for like, I don't know, like $7 cheaper and it's like the, the shipping's included. Um, I kind of wanted to make that plug, that sort of sales plug that I just made uh, up front because a lot of people are going to come for Todd uh, because Todd is well known and Todd wants to act like he's not and he's been very um, 
I don't know, like insistent that he doesn't get a special place in this this operation. He's uh, refused the position of keynote speaker. And so then I, <laughs> we were at his office earlier interviewing him. And I said, and he was asking how it's going to go and everything. And I said, well, you, we're going to have you go first. And he was like, well, I don't want to go first. I was like, well, you don't want to go last. You don't want to go first. He's like, no, I want to go for the same length everybody else does. I don't want to hog space and all of this. And it's like, I'm like, man, if we could just get you to talk for seven hours, we would. But uh, we can't. And so here's, here's what it's going to be. Before actually uh, having Todd come up here, I'm going to say a few words about what we are doing, what we have been doing, who we are, and why we're doing it. But I don't want to get too meta, and I don't want to get stuck on it for too long. But this way, Todd won't have gone first, nor will he have to go last. So uh, Theory Underground is what I've been calling a CMT experiment, which is to say a critical media theory experiment. It's an experiment in reinventing the medium. Because the internet is not just a flat, homogenous space. Every platform has its own capacities. And those capacities create tendencies. And those tendencies create dynamics. And those dynamics create the things that make you love or hate or love to hate and participate in platforms. And so this is very interesting from our standpoint as critical media theorists. Um, but as a form of practice and a, as, or praxis and as a form of experimentation, um, critical... The, what Theory Underground does for critical media theory, I think, is it helps us think about what uh, a nobody or a group of nobodies is able to accomplish. Because uh, I'm a nobody, and most of the people in this book that I'm holding right here are nobodies. And it's, obviously, we're singularities, and we're important, and blah, blah, blah. But what I mean is nobody gives a fuck. And so... We live in a world where we're told that we're in a democracy and we're told that we're represented and we're told that our voice matters and we're told that uh, our, if you vote this way or that way, then oh, then that represents you. And there's this idea that there's still a public out there somewhere and that we can participate in it and that if we participate in it, that's good because it's good to be civically engaged. But also, most of us, and I say us in this uh, exclusive sense, meaning people who kind of get it in the world of underground theory, most of us realize that we don't have access to any kind of a real, robust, uh, or rich uh, public. That we have access to the Walmart equivalent of a uh, discursive space. We have a, a Walmart equivalent of, uh, a, pla of uh, a public sphere. It's, it's not a public, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a store shelf, and we're the commodities being sold to ourselves. And it's weird. And we don't really know what to do with it. And we know that it makes us all neurotic and anxious and depressed and distracted in various ways that we're all trying to figure out. And so the idea with critical media theory for me is not just to think about it theoretically, but is also to try to do something with these things at our disposal, these technologies at our disposal, and to reinvent the medium. And so what that looks like right now at Theory Underground is that it is a platform it is my own platform. And people go, well, you, there's other people involved. What, are you a dictator? Yes, it's my fiefdom. I am a, I, this is neo-feudalism. I am a neo-feudalist realist, or a neo-feudal realist. And uh, I just think that it's the only way that we can survive in this world where everything is contained and there's walls everywhere and everyone has to su survive, or, or, or uh, survive, where everyone has to uh, contain and sort of put up walls to, uh, to, to protect and to, to preserve uh, a little something of our own, to be able to make something of our own, um, I think it's valid, and I think we have to do it to survive. That's the word that came up earlier. It wasn't supposed to come up when it did. So, uh, but no, it wouldn't be possible without you all joining virtually. It wouldn't be possible without the idea that real people here on campus might walk in, that uh, the whole tour involves the possibility of people who kind of belong to this idea of the public being able to intervene. Um, future tours will be a lot more uh, IRL or meet space uh, directed. This is a lot more internet directed as we figure out how to do hybrid events. This is all part of that experiment. But the, the medium itself, it's the message. But it also makes the messenger. 
right? It makes you something. And we want it to be something that helps us in jumping through its hoops and in, in having its dynamics play out on us, actually make us into something better, hopefully, right? Like, we want the kind of self-overcoming that we have, or that we are addicted to on these platforms with these dynamics to somehow to ha hack that into making us um, scholars, thinkers, theorists, um, and that that means teaching. And so Theory Underground is a teaching platform that has lectures, but it also has a social media component. It has forums, and it also has a blog to book pipeline. Meaning that if you submit a blog post on there for review and it gets accepted, you go to your profile, it'll actually show up there under the blog section. And then if it gets accepted to be published in an actual anthology like the one I'm holding here, um, then there you go. It'll be in a real book. And so the, the history of print um, folded into blogs and then in the last few months, because of Theory Underground, now it is folding back into blogs, back into books, right? But we don't want that to mean that the low bar set by blogs is then being put into more bullshit books at a time when more books are being printed than ever, but nobody's reading them. And if they're reading them, they're not able to systematize them, they're not able to hermeneutically work through them. Um, and so... You know, these are serious challenges that we are combating, um, and we have writer's workshops, and we have courses, and we have all kinds of stuff going on at Theory Underground, including the multilingualism events that happen every week. We are currently doing French, Spanish, and German on a weekly basis, and we aim to add like seven other languages to that. And the idea of the multilingualism event and putting it up front is that you, we are encouraging people to get lost in any language outside of English. Um, and to just fuck up and fail with us. Because in theory circles, people like to keep their cards close to their chest and never really talk about what they know or mean. Uh, they kind of keep it vague enough that they can't, you can never really pin them down. And it's because we don't like to fail. And in grad school, they teach you that the best way to overcome imposter syndrome is just to fake it till you make it. And we say, no, no, we're not going to fake it till we make it. We're just going to hang out with our ass out and fuck up. And we're all going to have fun doing it together. And so that's Theory Underground, and it has an app, which would be really cool if it worked. It hasn't worked now for three weeks. Uh, the whole time we've been on tour, I've been troubleshooting it every time we get a chance in a, in a coffee shop. I've got nothing but problems with my host, and then the, the people who are uh, on, the, on the plug-in for the app side on WordPress, and I've been the middleman between my host and these people, and it's a constant back and forth thing. And so I spent a lot of time when I would prefer to be writing or hanging out with people, troubleshooting that kind of thing, or troubleshooting this kind of hybrid tech conference setup thing. And so, I mean, I don't even know where to look. Like, do I look at you, Todd? Do I look at, do I look at the, the people up there on the screen? If I look at you all up on the screen, then it looks like I'm looking way away. The camera, this camera, should be like right there. I don't, I don't know what to do about that. So anyway, it's an, it's all just failing fast, and so that's why this is two or zero. Um, if anybody's seen the posters for this event, then you know this is two or zero. We did a little accent over the z, the, z, the z and zero because Slavoj gave us his blessing on the first day of our tour, and so of course he wasted it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, and so. The reason we call it zero is because we, this is the dry run, and we want to get it over with as quick as possible so that we can actually break into meet spaces and then see who's worth coming back to, who wants to have us come back, and more importantly, how are we going to do things different when we do come back, if we do come back. And so uh, we were just in Canada yesterday. We were at the McLuhan Institute in Bloomfield, Ontario, and then we spent the night at Terriot's house. A lot of you know him, Eamon Stephen Radecki. Um, he is a Marxist, um, used to be with the IMT, uh, and then he left recently. And it's, uh, it's an absolute amazing thing to meet someone like him in real life after we've been in dialogue for like seven years, right? Um, he and I were both influencers on the bread tube, left tube side of the internet uh, at the same time, and then we both left doing that around the same time and you know we've continued 
um, developing ourselves. And I think that part of the reason that we left was because we weren't really growing doing that influencer thing. And so, um, you know, it was great to meet him. It was amazing to meet Andrew McLuhan, the grandson of Marshall McLuhan, the son of Eric McLuhan, who's also an important media theorist who was absolutely f essential in keeping the name McLuhan alive. McLuhan predicted the internet 30 years before it happened. Um, a lot of people accuse him for being overly optimistic about the global village idea, but the fact is, is he was also uh, somewhat of a pessimist himself half the time, the other half the time. He wasn't. He was back and forth on this, as anyone who's honest with the world has to be. And so uh, we consider McLuhan to be a name like Marx, Freud, Darwin. We consider him to be essential because media theory is as important as psychoanalysis, is as important as critique of political economy, is as important as structural critique of anything that we do, existentialism, etc. And so that was yesterday, and then the day before that, a couple days before that, we were in Kansas City with Michael Downs. A couple days before that, we were in Breckenridge, Colorado with Philip Shin. Uh, a couple days before that, we were with Slavoj Žižek, virtually. He was joining us from Slovenia um, at, in Boise, Idaho. But that's also where Elton L. K. of the Working Class Intelligentsia and the Dead Parrots Philosophical Society, as well as Brian Weeks, who is a local educator there and one of my oldest compatriots. Um, I mean, he's not very old. He's, he's, he's pretty young. I mean, he's like my age, but like, you know, we've, we've been doing it for a long time. Like, I don't mean doing it. So, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, that's what we've done on tour so far. Uh, on the 17th of, what, th that's this weekend, we're doing an event with Samuel Loncar and, drum roll, Norman Finkelstein. Um, that's going to be in Midtown Manhattan, and I couldn't be more excited for that event. Uh, and then the, uh, the day after that, we're doing something with Daniel Tutt in Washington, D.C. That'll be, no, no, it's the day after the day after. So I think it's the 19th. We'll be doing that on the 19th. Um, we'll be doing that with uh, Andrew Flores, a.k.a. the Big Signorelli, who's right here on the screen behind you there. Todd? Yeah, Andrew. Um, and speaking of Andrew, one half of the Vanishing Mediators, the other half of the Vanishing Mediators will be with us in New York City. He will be presenting on Difference as Such with Samuel Longcar and Norman Finkelstein. Anyway, um, all of that information is available if you look hard enough. We've made all of this accessible if you really try. Um, and uh, outside of that, uh, I, I think I'm not going to run through all of the rest of the tour dates. Uh, one of the big notable ones, though, is a compatriot of, or a colleague of Todd's, Jennifer Friedlander, at, uh, in, in Claremont? Claremont, which is a satellite of the, in the metropolis of L.A., and um, she teaches at, what, P Panoma? Panoma College. Um, and that's where Catherine Liu will be the keynote speaker. And so that's going to be really cool to meet her in person. Um, and we'll be doing a bunch of multilingualism events there as well. So if you've been involved with the hub events here at Theory Underground, you'll want to be in on that. Um, just watch your emails. You'll probably get one very last minute. And it, if you can't spontaneously join, then I'm sorry that we're not getting... If, if I had a staff, it would be different, but we don't. And so this is how it is. Um, that's a lot, but that's basically what we've been up to, why we're doing it, and uh, all of those things. And so with all of that said, the way this is going to go is uh, Todd is going to present on the idea of freedom and German idealism, and then we will have Nance, and then Anne, and then myself. And uh, with that, go ahead and un unmute yourselves and clap to welcome Todd McGowan up here to the stage. They didn't actually do it. No, they didn't. <laughs> Is this, should I stand? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yep. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, I don't know that it's a compliment to say that my piece was the most academic one in the collection, but I guess I'll have to just deal with that. Uh, so I think German idealism it makes, so it, 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 German idealism, the dates of it, I, I see it as starting in 1781 when Immanuel Kant wrote the Critique of P Pure Reason, and then ending in 1831, say, when Hegel died. So Schelling outlived Hegel, but I think Schell because Schelling didn't really produce anything in his later life, it seems to me to make sense to date German idealism in this way. I think 
despite the fact that it's uh, 200 years old, it really speaks to us. To, it, it has some rele relevance today, and that's what I'd like to talk about. And I think the main thing that it's, that, that it's significant for is that it inaugurates a break in the idea of freedom. So Dave suggested that we put quotation marks around the word freedom. I think I understand that impulse because the way that freedom gets marshaled by capital society, it, it seems like freedom can only be an uh, ideological thing. It can only be something that, that makes us think like we're isolated subjects and free means I'm not going to let any, I'm not going to be influenced by the collective or think about the collective at all. Uh, German idealism has a radically different notion of freedom. And one of the things I want to contend, the thing I want to contend, is that German idealism gives us a different way to think about freedom than capitalist society does, than, than the, the image of liberal freedom. And I think that the, the, if we think about that difference, I think it, 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 it allows us to sustain freedom as an ideal and it allows us to think about how capital society should be, should be changed. Uh, so again, German idealism begins with Immanuel Kant, then it goes through uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who's an important follower of Kant, and then it goes through Schelling, and then through Hegel. So even though Schelling, Schelling's younger than Hegel, so, but, but nonetheless Schelling came, he became known as a thinker prior to, prior to Hegel, so I think it makes sense to date them in this, in this way, even though it's a little bit out of their, in terms of their lifetime, in terms of their chronology, it's a little bit out of chronology. So th what's interesting is they all, I think, as I said, conceive of freedom in an anti-capitalist fashion, because for them, freedom doesn't mean the ability to do whatever one wants. I think this is a really crucial thing that our liberal or capitalist idea of freedom is that freedom just means I can do what I want. Instead, for each of them, freedom means in some way limiting oneself, right? And so what they mean by how they consider limiting themselves, that's different in each case, but, in e but for all of them, the idea of the limit is in some way essential to freedom, whereas for liberal capitalism or for capitalism as such, I think the idea of thinking about freedom with a limit is it's incongruous. It doesn't make sense that, that freedom has to be the ability to surpass limits. And I think this turn to freedom as self-limitation really manifests itself first in the practical, the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant. So Kant, in 1781, when he writes the Critique of Pure Reason, that's a theoretical text. And it's only uh, four years later when he starts to think about uh, morality as a problem. And in, it's not until when is it, 1787 that he publishes the Critique of Practical Reason. So it's pure reason, practical reason. Practical reason for him is a moral, it's thinking about us as moral beings. So Kant doesn't, I think Kant's interesting. So he doesn't develop, obviously, a thorough critique of capitalism. But I think Kantian morality is nonetheless a thoroughly anti-capitalist morality. So I think it's fair to say that Kant, if, you, if you're adhering to Kantian morality, you're already thinking outside of, of a capitalist way of thinking. So I could, you could say that the, even the very existence of what Kant calls the moral law, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll no, it's like, okay. I was like, should I do this or not? Yeah, go ahead, but the do it. du it's duplicating you. And so we, no, we don't we want to be duplicated. No, we, you want to see yourself twice? We're going to hide the selfie. Yeah, there okay. you go. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. Uh, so for Kant, the, the very existence of the moral law means that we're not just reduced to our situation or to the givens that are, that are presented for us. So that means that the very existence of the moral law indicates that for Kant that we're free subjects. Now, how can, uh, that seems odd. It seems like it should be the other way around. Like we're, because we're free, we're governed by morality. But Kant's idea is, if, it, if we weren't, fr the, 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 the very way in which the moral law tells us we can't just do what we want, that is the indication that we're free to do not what we want, right? So the, the idea is that if we, if we were just, if we didn't have, if we didn't pose the moral law to ourselves, 
then we would be stuck in a situation Kant thinks of unfreedom. But the very posing of it, the very saying you could do otherwise than what you just inherently would do, is for Kant an indication of our freedom. So his idea is that, the, the, let's say, the, the tiger just goes out and eats a gazelle just because there's, it just, it's gonna, that's what it wants to do and it does it. But if I, for instance, I'm, I'm hungry, I don't have a job, I'm not suggesting this is a bad thing, but uh, I'm, you should go ahead and steal if you're hungry and don't have a job. Uh, but I'm hungry, I don't have a job, I can at least confront I don't have to necessarily, I'm not going to necessarily steal a bread without thinking, steal a loaf of bread without thinking, should I steal it or not? And so for Kant, that prob that the fact that it becomes problematic for me, that I don't just do it, is the indication that of the, the way in which freedom is introduced to us by the moral law. So I think that's, to me, that's the really important, uh, in terms of freedom, important Kantian gesture. So in other words, the act of imposing the law on oneself and, take, and, and, and taking the ought, we ought to do something, taking that into consideration is what the subject, it's, it's what makes subjectivity, and it's also what's emancipatory for subjectivity, Kant thinks. So, so this is a, I think that's the, the, obviously Kant made it really important discoveries and critique of pure reason, theoretical discoveries, but this idea, I think this, discovery of the moral law and the weight that it has for us as subjects is really unsurpassed in Kant's thought. And I think it shows the problem with a capitalist, liberal, more liberal idea of freedom. That for Kant, if we're just doing what we want, then we're always going to be allowing ourselves to be driven by our situation. Because what we want, I think Kant is right about this, what we want arises not from our own desire, but it arises from the situation that we're, we exist in. So that's really important for Kant. And I think by recognizing the problem with this liberal conception of freedom, Kant really anticipates how ideology is going to function. So he, he, in a way, I think, accounts for ideological manipulation. Right? Like the moral law is a way to say, OK, you're ideologically manipulated in all these ways, but you can still act otherwise. And I think we all have seen, have, there's such, we've been in situations where that pertains, right? Like we feel a lot of ideological pressure to act in a certain way, but there's still this possibility given to us by the moral law that we can act differently, we can act otherwise. So I think that's, for me, that's the, the crux of the Kantian project and, and how Kant thinks of freedom. So if we think freedom as, self -limit, as the self-limitation of morality, as Kant does, I think we in a way, bypass the problem of external constraints and bypass the problem of internal, ex, inter, internal constraints as well. So, in other words, Kant discovers the freedom in the imposition of the moral law precisely because we can't trace this law to anything about the subject's situation, its position, anything like that. So, the, the, this imperative that the moral law gives us is actually, what's interesting, I think, that we, we typically think of a moral imperative as something given to us by the superego, something that's some way in which the society is forcing us to constrain ourselves to its demands. And Kant thinks totally otherwise. So Kant's idea is, no, moral law isn't superegoic. Moral law is what frees you from society's demands, from superego, paradoxical conception of moral law, that it's not tied to superego. It's not tied to what we think of traditionally as conscience. Instead, it's what lifts us out of those kinds of traps. So for Kant, the origin of the moral law is the subject's self-relating, like how it relates to itself. What Kant would call reason, but we might call some kind of negativity of subjectivity, right? So we don't just relate to ourselves as positive, but we always have a distance from ourselves. And it's through this distance that the moral law even emerges. And as a form, the moral law has the ability to bracket everything about our character and about our situation. And I think that's this, the, the, this radical negativity of it is the mark of its radicality as a form. Uh, this imposition of a limit on oneself is a measure, I think, of one's emancipation 
from one's own good. So you can, you, you, to, to, for Kant, to follow, to follow the moral law is absolutely not to do what's good. And I think this is a, this to me is a, is a, one of Kant's most important legacies. That he's, and, and one of the ways in which he anticipates certain ideas of psychoanalysis. That, that following the moral law, there's a, there's a clear moral imperative, but it's not to make things better. So the good makes one act according to one's situation, one's proclivities, but the moral law forces you to go against that. So, so it's, a, it's a defiance of the power of the good, and that's what the moral law, that's why the moral, so, so if I'm following the moral law, I have to obey it, and it doesn't matter if what turns out from it is maybe negative. And Kant has a very famous example of this, that if there's a murderer coming to my door and says, there's someone inside, I'm, I'm searching for someone inside, is the person that, you're hi that I'm searching for inside your house. For Kant, I'm not allowed to lie and say, oh, no, uh, actually that person isn't here. Kant's idea is, no, you have to tell the, the truth because the moral law demands that you tell the truth. So I think that example, whatever we think of the, uh, there's been many attempts to try to get out of the problem, like to say, well, you could distract them and say something else. Uh, Fichte makes an interesting point, I'll get to it in a little bit. Fichte says, actually, you're obliged to defend the person to your death. You just can't lie to the person that comes to the door. I thought it's kind of interesting. I think it's a pre-Nazi conception of things. But anyway, uh, 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 I think that, 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 that for Kant, I think th that's nice about that example is it shows how the good and the moral law are incompatible. Or not, maybe they're incompatible is too strong, but they're not, they're not, they don't coincide. They don't coincide. Because if you're trying to look out for the good of the person hiding in your house, you're going to lie. So I think that's, the, that's one of the things that Kantian morality is doing, that it's trying, to, it's trying to articulate our freedom from our situation and freedom, this is related to that, freedom from the idea of the good, that we're not trying to always do what's good either for ourselves or for other people. So the problem is that that the good, rather than being an ideal that we should strive toward, strive toward is actually a temptation. And I think Eve, this is how Kant, how Kant thinks of it, that, that if we're doing something for someone else's good, then for Kant, we're not acting freely, or even for our own good, we're not acting freely and we're not following the moral law. So for Kant, I have to do my duty for my duty's sake, not because some kind of benefit will accrue to myself, to the other, to the social order, et cetera, right? So the fact that this makes me socially uncomfortable is, I think, for Kant, the indication that I'm acting, acting morally. So Kant goes pretty far in terms of the moral law. But as I suggested, I think Fichte goes even further. So Fichte, he claims that the freedom generated by the moral law is the sole value for a subject. So for Fichte, so Fichte was a very close follower of Kant, so much so that he wrote a book that, he, that people thought was written by Kant, his first book. He had published it anonymously. And then Kant was like, hey, I didn't write that. And, he was, and Kant initially distanced himself from Fichte because he thought Fichte was a little, take, took things a little too far. And I think maybe he did, and that's what's, what I like about him. Uh, I think there's an argument that Fichte is the most radical thinker in the history of Western thought, but I'm not going to make that argument right now. Uh, so Fichte's idea is that if all value of subjectivity comes from our morality, right? Because that's the source of our freedom. That, that's what frees us from our situation, frees us from our things that we're inherited, everything. So he thinks it's more important that we follow the moral law than we survive. So for Fichte, to choose survival over morality is to turn, which I think most of us do on a daily basis, he thinks is to turn yourself into a thing. That is to abandon your subjectivity. And I think this is pretty, pretty great. That without the moral self-limitation, you're really nothing but just what your circumstances produce. That the moral self-limitation is the way you overcome your circumstances. And, that, and, and, and I think that makes clear, Fichte I think makes nicely clear, the connection between morality and freedom, right? Because through that self-limitation, 
of morality, you're, you're lifting yourself up above whatever your circumstances are and whatever they, they want to create, force you to do, make you do, right? So, so in other words, obedience, so I think it's paradoxical to think of it this way, but I think obedience to the moral law is the only way to escape a capitulation to capitalist society. This is why I think that's, that's Fichte's idea. And I, I mean, he doesn't talk, he does, he's pre-Marxist, so he doesn't talk about capitalism so much, but I think there is a kind of inherently anti-capitalist idea. To Fichte, so, so on to Hegel and Schelling, the, I think the most, so I know I just said great things about both Kant and Fichte, but I think Hegel and Schelling are the great, the most important figures uh, of German idealism at least, and they, what they, because they take us away from necessarily the ground of morality. And they, they separate freedom from morality, I think, in a very important way. So they extend this idea of self-limitation beyond just the moral ground. So Schelling's philosophy of freedom uh, reaches its highest point in this very famous essay called The Philosophical Investigation of the Essence of Human Freedom. It's amazing. It's not long. It's an amazing essay. Martin Heidegger did a whole seminar on it. Uh, Schelling insists, this is a very interesting point, he insists that evil is the source of our freedom. And he, he goes, he, 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 in that essay, he looks back to the beginning of creation and says there must be some moment where evil can emerge because if we weren't capable of evil, we wouldn't have any possibility of freedom. So he, even though he comes at the question of freedom opposite of Kant from the question of evil instead of the question of morality, Schelling ends up at the same point, that is, that he thinks freedom becomes, freedom lies in our ability to be self-determining, self-limiting beings. So whatever way that we limit ourselves, that's our, that's our freedom. Uh, Hegel, sorry, Hegel's interesting. So he, unlike Schelling, so Hegel and Schelling, just a little bit of a background, Hegel and Schelling were really close friends. They went to the seminary together, and then they had a split that no one knows why it happened, really. So there's a theory that, that uh, Schelling didn't like what Hegel wrote about him in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit. But that, I'm not, Hegel certainly didn't think he was writing something bad about Schelling. So it's, it's, a very, it's strange. I don't, I'm not, I don't really have a good theory, except my, I mean, my theory is that, that Hegel became, Schelling was famous when he was really young, like 25. And then Hegel became the great philosopher in Germany. And I think that didn't sit well. With, and Schelling, they, they, their paths went like opposite, right? Uh, so uh, I think that that may be, some people that would bother. I don't know, I, I, I would be happy to be the one going down. <laughs> but, uh, but I think Schelling wasn't so much. Uh, anyway, so, so uh, Hegel takes Kantian duty really as his starting point. And he locates freedom not in, but he, he adapts duty into a, in, in, in slightly. So he does, unlike Schelling, he doesn't see freedom in evil. He sees freedom in what he calls the form of the concept. So the, con and the concept itself is freedom. So Hegel sees the self-limiting act of freedom in our very way of th how our thinking manifests itself, right? So in order to think about something, we have to, do, we have to think through a self-limiting, right? We can't, like if you tried to think, and I think it's just, it's almost commonsensical. Like if you tried to think about everything, it would just be a blur. So to think conceptually is to think a limit on what you're thinking about. And so for Hegel, this act of limiting oneself is the fundamental act of subjectivity, just like Fichte thought, but it's not, it's not necessarily tied to morality, it's tied to our very act of thinking. So I think this is, to me, it's pretty incredible that I am really the series of limitations that I erect for myself through the concept. So how I think is how I determine myself as a free being and how I act on the basis of that thinking. So, He's the, I think Hegel is the first to think about the concept as self-limitation and as freedom. And I think he makes the most sustained argument for the role that it plays in freedom in the, his 
book, The Science of Logic. So this is what he, this is what he says. I'm just going to quote a little bit. Uh, in the concept, the kingdom of freedom is disclosed. The concept is free because the identity that exists in and for itself constitutes the necessity that constitutes and constitutes the necessity of substance exists at the same time as sublated or as positedness. This positedness is that very identity. Sorry, that was a little, it got a little kind of crazy. But uh, the concept is the kingdom of freedom. I think this, that's pretty clear. And the concept is free. Why? Because the identity is both itself and what it isn't. Right? Like that for him. So there's the way in which the concept limits itself by establishing a barrier, some kind of what it is. It establishes what it isn't, and then it, it is both this thing that it is and it isn't. But it's only relating to what it isn't through the barrier that it establishes. That's for Hegel what conceptual thinking is. So the concepts, the act, you might say, whereby the subject gives itself a determinate existence by limiting itself. Whatever we do, we, any kind of conceptual thinking, we're limiting ourselves. So concept brings subjectivity together with what it isn't, and we think about what we aren't. When we think about what we aren't, we think about ourselves. That's, that's Hegel's idea. And at each act of thinking, thought, and the concept actually is the way that we determine ourselves, that we're free. So if, let me just give an example. If I conceptualize the color pink, I create a determination in the world. I see pink as a possible color for things that I can relate to. And all of a sudden, it's possible for me to relate to things in the world that are pink. Yes? Uh, once I have the concept, I see things in terms of this concept rather than simply being amazed before this plenitude of things. Right? Like, all of a sudden, things are limited. Right? Like, that thing that was just a bunch of stuff, I now say, oh, there's pink there. But that limiting actually allows me to relate to it. And, act, and it allows, and that's the source of my freedom. Like my ability to limit things in this conceptual way of thinking, that's my freedom for Hegel. So you see how it's going beyond both Kant and Fichte's, their tie, they want to tie, uh, they want to tie freedom to morality. And they want to divorce freedom from theoretical speculation, right? And so what Hegel is doing is allowing us to see the connection between our very act, the most theoretical act we have, thinking conceptually, and freedom. So yeah, of course, like morality is still tied to freedom for Hegel, but he's extending it further into our very way of thinking theoretically or thinking conceptually. So that, I think, is the, is the great breakthrough. And, and, and the point is that, that it's, again, this way of thinking through limitation or thinking about limitation as the site of freedom. And if we, if, we, if we think in this way, and if we act in this way, obviously, then I think it's, it, it, it shows that there's something, an alternative to the capitalist way of thinking. Because the point is not how much you can accumulate, like how, how or how many different things you can do. Instead, it's, it's how can I structure myself, how can I limit myself in some way? So I think German idealism's great discovery is a conception of freedom for modernity that is a counter to capitalism's, the only version in capitalism, right? That this of I, freedom to do what I want and freedom to get as much as I can, right? So the, but I think the real opposition is between freedom as unlimited, like it's, and freedom as self-limitation. Like obviously it's not freedom if someone else is limiting me. Right? Like if someone else says, if a cop says you can't cross the street, I can't say to myself, oh, that's an act of freedom on my part. Right? Like that would be stupid. But the act of self-limitation is something else. Right? Like self-limitation self is freeing oneself from the plethora of possibilities that capital is constantly offering. Right? So it means, it means shutting certain things down as a possibility. Like, I'm not, like, not going to look for a car to buy because I don't, that's, I, that's just not part of my possibility. Like, all, the, quite, things like that, I think. So my contention is the freedom to do what one wants should really be called unfreedom. And what we should call, we, sh we should think that all freedom is just the freedom of self-limitation, right? So uh, 
that's the only term that really merits the name. And I think Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel are, they point the way in this direction. Now, okay, they're not usually considered the great philosophers of the left or emancipatory philosophers. Right? It's more Marx and that tradition. But I think they, I think because of this idea of freedom, they should be. Like, I think they're really allowing us to rethink just fundamental value of capitalist society and think of it totally differently, right? Like, so, so if you could, like, I understand that you have to, there has to be actual struggle and like ideological struggle isn't the end of the game. But I do think if we could, if people thought of freedom in this way, I think certain aspects of capital society would no longer be possible. So I do think that that's a, I think that there's something to that struggle of, and I think this is why they're really important figures. Just changing our idea of freedom would have certain concrete ramifications. So I think they show us how to oppose the unfreedom of capitalist accumulation with an alternative. And so I think there's a real alternative here, and I think we have to fight for the definition of capitalist's most precious word, freedom. I don't think we need to put in quotation marks, Dave can, uh, but I think we need to restore the sense that the word had in the epoch of German idealism. So I, I, I hope I didn't talk too long and I'm gonna stop. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know that this has been a, a sort of conversation that I've been having with Anne for a while now because we've, we've read some Kant and we've been thinking about ethics. And uh, so uh, she just said, wow, I don't think the microphone picked it up for the people who are hearing this online. And so I thought I would just echo, wow, that's really cool. Thank you, Todd. And so I'm going to um, invite Nance up here in a second. Let me see, introduce him, though. So, his name is Bryce Nance, but he goes by Nance. Or at least, it's weird to call him Bryce. It just doesn't sound right coming. It just, one, t one time I heard someone say it, and I was like, wow, that sounds terrible. Yeah, no, it's Nance. And uh, Nance is actually a verb. You, you can actually Nance it up. You can, you can get Nanced. And that, that used to mean partying. Now it means studying at Theory Underground. Uh, he, he, if you if you want to go hard in the paint, then you nance it up. So um, he has gone hard this year at, at Theory Underground, and so basically he was supporting Theory Underground, um, like all of you, before uh, uh, back in the Theory Plebe days. But then recently, uh, Theory Underground began. It just kicked off December sixth, twenty twenty two, and he was there for the Idea of the University course. He was there for the Professional Managerial Class Consciousness and Ideology course. He was there for, I mean, what are the other courses? The For They Know Not What They Do course, the Critical Media Theory course, the What Is Sex course with Cadell Last, the, bring, uh, the Being in Time course, which we've now finished Division 1 of Being in Time, and Division 2 uh, kicks off on January 6, 2024. And uh, he's also going to be there for the introduction to Nick Land being taught by Michael Downs. And so um, that's all the courses that currently exist or are on the, in the near future at Theory Underground. There's plenty more in the works. I'm really excited for next year. Um, and I'm mostly excited about it because he's involved. Uh, to be honest, it's, it's because of Nance and a handful of other people who are that engaged. Um, and there are other people who are super engaged, but they don't have the time energy. Uh, to be able to participate. And uh, by some fluke of the system or luck of the draw, he's able to actually put in the effort um, and read these books with me. And it's not just the ones in the actual courses that he's reading. It's also uh, these B-side deep dives that we did. He just reminded me when we were talking with Todd in the office, we did a 24-hour um, two, two streams over the course of 24 hours. These were not public. Um, where we read through Heidegger and Ruins by uh, Richard Wool and, and talked about it. And I did my sort of impromptu uh, contextualizing and we problematized, but, and we tracked certain things and we, we, we had a couple of interpretive methods like on the table as we went through it all. And that's the kind of exegetical deep dive stuff we like to do and it's honestly something that everybody should be able to do because everybody should be able to have the time and energy to be able to do things like this. But if we don't do it, and show people all the kinds of cool stuff you can do if you have your time energy, then nobody's gonna really get the time energy bug enough, at least, to make it happen. 
which is to make the kind of world where we can study philosophy and play instruments and bands with friends and speak multiple languages and travel the world and literally hashtag be your best self, right? Exactly what capitalism wants us to be able to do but isn't able to give us. And so we're trying and we're, we're trying and we're doing it and the fact is is this tour kind of comes out of conversations of the stuff that we want to do with the underground and it comes out of all of the ideas that we share together and so um, just yeah he's one of the uh, uh, partners in crime here and uh, outside of that he's just a random skateboarder from Phoenix Arizona right he's just a random skateboarder um, so put your hands together for a random skateboarder from Phoenix Arizona He'll be talking about his piece in Underground Theory. And he'll even read a part of it. <laughs> What's happening, everybody? I am, in fact, going to read a little bit of my piece that is in the uh, Underground Theory. And then I'll probably ramble for a little bit. And hopefully I don't go too long. Um, so the piece that I submitted to Underground Theory, it, uh, the PMC and the walls that separate us from them. And you should buy a copy of the book and uh, read a lot of other pieces first. But when you get, get some free time, you can read mine too. Um, when I was young, there were few things in the world I wanted as much as to become Dr. Nance, professor of arts and sciences. Knower, knower of things in general, expert mathematician and titan of philosophy, all-around well-to-do gentleman, paragon of the modern age, a serious fellow traveler of theory underground and friend. Oh, that was a That's typo. That's a typo, yeah. So that, that last one wasn't there. That comes next. I'm sure there were some fantastical things I would have I wanted more, but as far as things that might come true, becoming a world-renowned academic was the height of my desire. Things didn't work out that way, and I have still failed to fully come to terms with, with that fact as an adult. My partner and our friends are all masters of some thing, according to various state universities. They've accomplished my lifelong dream of graduating grad school, and we genuinely have a great time when we're all together. But I can't help feeling like I am constantly failing to live up to some unspoken standard, like they are judging me and finding me lacking, like I'm an outsider. Like there exists a wall that I can't, no matter how I might try, scale or tunnel under or break through that sets us apart from one another. It's not a wall that anybody intentionally built, just one that sprung up over the years. I was born poor white trash. I had to climb a mountain of shit just to be at the foothills, foothills that my chosen tribe takes for granted. And along the way, I collected many scrapes and scars that I simply can't hide. And while those marks are merely consequential, they do bear meaningful content. I am in some way, due to our differing backgrounds, fundamentally other from them and they from me, in ways that we have been conditioned to think are questions of moral worth or ability or utility. I have always had a hard time taking people who didn't have it rough as a kid seriously. I harbor sometimes immense resentment towards people who've had an easier road than I. I look at people who grew up in seeming, seemingly functional families who had all the things I saw on TV and coveted, and I think they are unable to experience, in life, experience life in some key way. There is this sense that they lack some level of understanding that makes me better. I know this is all bullshit. Just a way to comfort myself in the long darkness. Nevertheless, I cling to it. And I'll stop there for now and, and kind of go and ramble a little bit. The other day in Kansas City in Raytown, um, I mentioned the fact that I grew up poor white trash as, uh, as part of my talk. And after the fact, someone came up and asked me what I meant by that. And I don't really know what I mean by that. That's something that... Um, like, I know what I mean, but trying to explain it to someone who doesn't already know, it's kind of it's kind of weird because it's not a thing that really matters all that much. It's kind of one of those, like, loose identity things that so many people are so heavily invested in nowadays. Um, but it, it's, 
it's like a thing I carry around with me, and it's, it's a, a chip on my shoulder that sometimes gets in the way of uh, genuinely engaging with people, um, but also helps me explain away things that other, like otherwise would, would really bother me and piss me off. Um, but yeah, it, it was interesting. And I don't know why I'm talking about the white trash thing now. Um, but the, the ways in which we categorize ourselves, the, the, the ways in which we try to belong to larger groups um, tend to cover up like this, this lack that we feel or, or this failure that we feel um, in, in society and in the course of our everyday lives because we all realize everything sucks um, and we're not really getting all our needs met and we're not really doing the thing that we want to be doing or, or that we pretend to be doing. Um, we're all just kind of going through the motions. Um, and to comfort ourselves and, and assuage our feelings, we create these categories and, and we cling to them. Um, and so certain college-educated progressive liberals have their clubs that they belong to, and that's fine and dandy. And I do use those words as a slur sometimes, and some rancor comes out of me when I say them because I just can't hold it back because I do resent it. Like I. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had all the things that I don't have, right? That's kind of always the way it works. Um, but I do the same thing, too. Like, I, I invest in my bullshit identity categories. Because um, there's so many more things I'd, I would like to be doing. I would like to be engaged in some effective political action. I would like to be... Um, I would like to achieve actual self-actualization. You know, they tell you always, be your best self, do the thing, everything is awesome. Um, and it never really seems to work because we're all kind of stuck in the situation. Um, and, and all we can do is spin our wheels um, unless, we, unless we engage in some type of radical break. Like, um, when all you ever do is just kind of put your nose to the grindstone, um, you're stuck in that survival mode. You can't choose, you know, the moral questions, the ethical questions. Um, and from my perspective, the taking the, the PMC course um, kind of opened my eyes. Like, before the course, I didn't even want to engage with the idea of the PMC because I had heard it used. And um, I was just like, oh, that's just some edgy dirtbag post left internet bullshit. But then actually, like, actually engaging with the course, I realized, oh, that really does say all the things that I already hold to be true. Like, yeah, that lays out the argument that I'm already on the side of, and it just puts it up in a nice little package. And, and delivers it. Um, and I, I think it's important, I think we should all be more willing to engage with not just the, the topic of the PMC, but like really what it represents, the neoliberalization of everything. And um, I think the coming neo-feudalism, um, and I'm not ready to unpack that yet, but eventually I'm going to get to the point where I can explain what I mean, because I don't mean what Yanis Varoufakis means, but I think uh, he gets a long way there. Um, but it, it is the case now where if you don't do all the right things and you, and you don't fit into the right categories and um, do the right performative actions, um, and, and play by the right rules, you, you are excluded from public life. Um, you, in many cases, can be excluded from, you know, career opportunities. And again, it sucks to focus on survival, but we, we kind of all have to focus on survival. Um, but I really do feel like the, the PMC, um, and that being the, the managers, um, 
and the people who are ostensibly in charge, I really do think they're building more and more walls to exclude more and more people. Um, and, and for me, I, that's probably one of the most important things going on right now. I also think it's important um, to build our own walls, I think, with, with projects like Theory Underground, and, and there are other projects as well. Um, we are entering spaces that are necessarily exclusive, and that's kind of weird because we're all some version of leftists and we don't want to exclude anybody. And uh, it's not a question of, of moral worth, it's not a question of ability, but it is a question of um, being effective. Like if, if this was just free and open to all and, and there were no um, re requirements, um, it would turn into you know, just some other internet influencer thing like this. Spaces like Theory Underground really are intentional spaces where we can engage rigorously uh, and, and study topics that, I mean, Jesus Christ, just pardon language, a month and a half ago or whatever, we, we sat and read Descartes uh, for six hours straight. And I was like, dude, I haven't, like, I fucking haven't read Descartes. Like, that's just not a thing I ever really cared about. It was like, oh, yeah, sure, I get it. Um, but having the space to do that and having the infrastructure to do that, and yeah, it's all homemade and it's all like shoestrings and duct tape. Um, but that is necessarily going to exclude people that maybe don't have the focus, definitely don't have the time energy, and that's one thing we're trying to bring to people. Um, but it, it takes an obsessive energy. It, it, it takes a determination. It takes a resolve to um, make that radical break from, you know, the environment. Because I could just smoke weed and jack off or whatever. Um, but that sucks. So I'm going to read the last bit of my piece now. Yeah. One quick question is, uh, what is the PMC? PMC, the professional managerial class. And you can read about it in underground theory. <laughs> or you could go to theory-underground.com and take the course. Uh, or read the Aaron Reichs or... The whole playlist is on the front page, yeah. Yeah, or go to the YouTube channel and the entire playlist is there with the course and all that. And yeah, so I'll start here on the last page of my piece. I'm inclined to state that the PMC argument presaged and prefigured Giannis Varoufakis' neo-feudalism or something similar, but that's neither here nor wherever you are. It's too late to do anything about the changes we're arguing about, trying to decide if they happened or not, but it's not too late to take seriously the idea that there are still people situated in positions that give them access to some form of power. Why would anybody want to give up on that in favor of some petty recognition? Capital stumbled upon the realization that the maintenance of order can no longer be left to episodic police violence, that it is more effective to make people believe they are already living the dream or on track to achieve it than to confront them with their very powerlessness. Thus, the progressive leanings of the PMC, which maintain a popular belief in the system itself, manages to reincorporate the regressive position that they are deserving experts who rose to the top of a meritocracy. They are the deserving and that we must respect the democratic process, else we become ourselves the deplorables. The fact that there is progress creates a sense of progress, a telos that people can buy into and remain unproblematically disengaged. Add to that, the, to that the fact that it is already a heroic feat for any working people to become engaged when they have no surplus time energy in the first place, and it's no wonder that people believe that things which amount to little more than consumer choices, e.g. voting, buying cr cruelty-free pineapples from Whole Foods, etc., are radical and emancipatory. We have no power to make meaningful choices, so we convince ourselves that the choices we can make really do matter. We vote Team Blue or Team Red and consume products and content that gives us a feeling of recognition and belonging. We form parasocial bonds with brands and figures. We give up on the process of becoming human, and we let, our, we let others, 
entertainers, products, media franchises, and so on, do it for us because we are completely alienated from our own selves and our time energetic potential to self-actualize in any meaningful ways. So there I sit at the dinner table with my college educated friends and family. And if I try to talk theory, they roll their eyes. The fact is they have their degrees, their opinions, their credentials, and me, I'm that fuck up, burnout, dropout loser whose bullshit they humor because they're tolerant. And I humor them while they wax righteous about purchases at Whole Foods. I'm an outsider on the inside and it's weird. These walls are not just between us, they also stand between my deserving self who has something worth saying and that fucked up loser who should shut up and take notes when my betters are speaking. Does any of it matter? <laughs> Is it too late to do anything? Is change beyond the scope of what's possible? I don't know. It depends on the day. Some days I feel some days I feel like there is something genuinely radical about a place where people like me can get a crash course in the idea of the university, the professional managerial class, and so much more. The question is whether this is only radical for me as an individual or whether this will have broader societal ripple effects. Is it too late? I can't seem to silence the little voice that says we missed our opportunity. In the 19th century, we were still arguing over whether or not humans have souls. Now in the 20th, those of us who do theory and stand stand back in horror and watch as this dark machine god devours them by that book thank you thanks so much thanks so much Nance good job um, you know he beats himself up a lot about his speaking abilities and I think he's a good public speaker Todd just did the, yeah, duh. So there you go. That's your symbolic, I don't know what you need, but you got it. Um, but also, his, his writing voice, his actual, your writing voice is, the, is, is a different kind of voice than your normal discourse, right? And um, I think there's really something special about that piece, and that's why, that's why it's in there, man. So thank you. Um, now we are going to list, uh, hear from... Anne Snellgrove McCarricker. Dr. Anne, yeah. Dr. Anne, knower of things in general. Um, there's a little nepotism in this whole thing. Like I said, it is a fiefdom, so of course there's nepotism. Anne is my wife. We just got married a few weeks ago. Um, I've known her for five years, or I've been getting to know her for five years, and it's been the best five years of my life. Nothing that is happening here or that has ever happened in the last five years really would be possible without her in my life. Um, she gets me through everything, blah, 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 the intimate stuff. It, but I don't want to um, focus on that. The fact is, is she's a scholar, an intellectual, and a thinker in her own right. And that uh, she comes at things from a social science background. She has a bachelor's in social science from Boise State University. As you're about to find out, that doesn't mean very much, right? Because that's her piece is a critique of that situation. But it does if you make it into something. Even if, the, even if the bar has been lowered, you can, you, can, you can push yourself and you can challenge yourself in a million different ways. And I've watched her do that. And I, I just, I'm really excited to not only see how far she's come, but also to see where she's going. She's going to be uh, pursuing a master's at Boise State uh, this coming spring. And she's in the process of doing all the paperwork and all of that in the middle of a tour right after our wedding. So it's like it, we're doing so many different things. But beyond all of that, she's also co-teaching the critical media theory research cohort with me at Theory Underground. That's been awesome. It's been like one of the best things that's ever happened um, in, in terms of my own research, my own academic um, conversations that I have with other people. Uh, and I think that all the people involved with it feel the same way. So the other class that she taught at Theory Underground with me and Brian Weeks was called uh, The Idea of the University, Carl Jaspers, The Idea of the University. And that was the first course taught at Boise State University, be or sorry, <laughs> at Theory Underground, because we, and myself and Brian, all had gone to Boise State University and found it lacking. Now, of course, there's professors we love, there's administration we love, we have high hopes that the institution can somehow be reformed or torn down and something better built in its place. But either way, the point is, is, is that we got a lot out of it, but also part of what we got out of it was a critique of it. And 
the idea of the university is a cool kind of critique because it upholds the ideal, flushes out the ideal, and contrasts that against what we actually have in the neoliberalized university. And that's what Anne's here to talk about today. Please put your hands together to welcome her. So the first thing I'm gonna do, if I can, is prop this laptop up a little bit because I don't like the angle <laughs> of it. There we go. It's a little better. Okay. Um, Nance and I did not talk about really the plan for our talks, but I'm pretty much going to do the same thing. So now I look like I'm copying him. But I figured this is like a book tour, and we have a book. It's under the laptop now. Um, and I wanted to read from the book a little bit because we haven't done much of that. Um, and then and talk about it and wax philosophical about it and do what Nance did, um, basically. So... Um, the piece that I contributed to Underground Theory is called The Idea of the Neoliberal University, Reflections of a Disenfranchised College Graduate. Um, I'm going to read the introduction, kind of talk about what's in the middle, read my conclusion, and maybe relate it back to our theme of the day, uh, freedom. Whoop. Okay. For those of you who haven't been enrolled in an American university for a while or ever, I'll let you in on a little not-so-secret secret. College sucks. I don't just mean that in the stereotypical, oh, college is really hard and boring kind of way. What I mean is that the educational quality of the university is much lower than most Americans expect or realize. An institution that we once thought was devoted to rigorously educating citizens and equipping them with the necessary skills for a lifelong career and beyond is now an overpriced corporate job training institute in which students' main goal is to receive a piece of paper that supposedly qualifies them for a career. I realize I'm like blocking my face from this. I'm so sorry, you online people. Um, <laughs> and I can put it on the briefcase. The this is fine yeah um yes to receive a piece of paper that supposedly qualifies them for a career much has changed politically economically and socially to lead the to the decline of this important institution the current state of the american university seems to reflect an overall anti-intellectual and pro-hustle culture in which human beings are reduced to employees with only a small amount of time and energy on the evenings and weekends to casually pursue hobbies cultivate family and friendships and better themselves as individuals what has happened to this institution and why is it no longer fulfilling its one stated mission to pursue truth I have had the unique experience of being a student, adjunct course instructor, and researcher of higher education all within a short period of time. Somehow during my three years of college, three years as a college student, I was never introduced to Carl Jasper's The Idea of the University, a book that I now believe should be a foundation for all university students. However, because of my experience as a student and instructor, as well as what the various sociological research on higher education suggests, I'm not surprised that we were never introduced to Jaspers or anything remotely close to as important or rigorous. Jaspers defines the ideal university as a community of scholars and students engaged in the task of seeking truth. While I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to have attended a public university, take courses from a few notable professors, and graduate debt-free in three years, I in no way experienced this academic community or engaged in much real truth seeking. I feel as though I left the institution more cynical than ever, and I yearn for a model of higher education that Jaspers would believe in. And so in this piece, I kind of take us through um, some of the sociological literature that already exists, talking about the contrasts between uh, education, specifically higher education, American higher education in the 1960s and 70s, uh, pre and during the Vietnam era, and the conservative kind of reactionary response that really corporatized our universities, took funding out of the liberal arts and humanities, um, put funding towards advertising and promoting the college and making it this big thing that would bring in students, raising the price. And I think, you know, we can blame the word we all use all the time, neoliberalism, for that. Um, but what is neoliberalism? 
Um, David Harvey has a great little book called A Brief History to Neoliberalism or Brief Introduction to Neoliberalism. And he uh, defines it as uh, the doctrine that market exchange is an ethic in itself capable of acting as a guide for all human action. And so money, markets, and private property are all prioritized over individuals under this model. And what this means for the university is that it now runs as a business uh, and students are viewed as consumers versus an institute of higher education where students are viewed as tr truth seekers. And so... <clears throat> Like I mentioned, I, I had this kind of unique experience of being normal undergraduate student coming from out of state, um, re, uh, participant in a research cohort, the Intermountain Social Research Lab with the sociology department, where our spo focus was specifically on neoliberal higher education. And then uh, like less than a year later, um, an adjunct instructor for a course called Is College Worth It? talking about the neoliberal university and kind of trying to engage with students on a 100 level course. I was the discussion group leader, but I did help develop the course kind of based off of the research that the sociology department had done. And so all of these things combined, I just got to see a lot of different things going on in the university. My own cynical experiences in all of those positions left me going, I don't know about this whole university thing, but at the same time, um, I'm still hopeful. I still believe in it. I still am, like Dave said, I'm going to go get my master's degree. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the conclusion. Um, but throughout the piece, I, I talk about, you know, the ways in which I saw this, these neoliberalized aspects being reflected within the university. So my courses were increasingly less engaging and rigorous actually than my high school courses were. I mean, I was a sociology student, well, primarily a sociology student, and to my knowledge, I, that I can remember, I was never assigned a primary set text, like sociologist. Um, yeah, little blurbs in a textbook, but no one ever said, we're gonna read a book. The books I read were freaking teen novels in 400 level like social change classes. Um, I was in 400 level classes where I was hoping to read some rigorous theory and we ended up just being asked our opinions and being you know, given student presentations that were sloppily thrown together for half of the semester. So I came in you know, really wanting to like engage and, and, uh, and embody this idea of the university, this community of truth seekers, people wanting to engage and wanting to have dialogues and learn and really dig into texts. And then like writing you know, sloppy, responses on a discussion board and and to be fair i half of my schooling uh in my undergraduate was pre-covid half was both during and immediately after covid and covid lockdowns we were all freaking out everything was switched online really really fast um and that was tough for everyone and and i can admit that during that time especially i maybe you know didn't put as much effort in as I could have and wasn't engaging as well as I could have been, but not like the class content, the class level, like just dropped because of the craziness going on. Um, but within that, I mention and talk about a little bit how online courses even are a great way for the neoliberal university to essentially, I love this term, um, McDonaldize the university. It's a term developed or kind of theorized by George Ritzer, who plays off of Weber's um, idea of rationalization. And so McDonaldization, the model of the McDonald's fast food restaurant, um, the way that they have been able to systematize and control and calculate all aspects of their process and repeat it every place, every restaurant in the country, in the world. Um, we see that applied to a lot of other aspects of, of social life, including the university. And so an online course is just this easy cookie cutter. We can repeat it a million times. We can put, you know, hundreds of students in it if we have to. And we especially saw, ooh, my piece disappeared. Um, the rise of that, uh, sorry, in, during COVID. Um, Another kind of aspect of neoliberalization within the university that I think relates to the professional managerial class ideology that has seemingly taken over our culture is, um, I'm calling it like the wokeification of the university. And so I share a couple of examples of things that happened while I, anyone who's watched any news or just heard any stories or 
is been engaged in the university at all can kind of see these instances of a lot of like social justice ethic and rhetoric on the campus which there can be good to that but what i experienced and what i viewed was a limiting of academic freedom because when everyone feels like they're walking on eggshells afraid to say the wrong thing afraid to be critical of the discourse of the popular discourse um you can not you necessarily cannot have academic freedom you necessarily cannot have rigorous dialogue and disagreements and that is where pursuing truth and trying to to understand it and and really be rigorous in the knowledge and the field um we can't have that without it and so I experienced that as a student, even within the research cohort in the sociology department, and I just I just saw it happening all over the country in my friends' universities. Um, and finally, I think within this section, I I talk about you know the the emphasis on the corporate the corporate presence on the university, the emphasis on uh, what's called like the beer and circus of college campus life. So oh maybe this university has a great education or English department, but uh, do they have a rock climbing wall? Do they have a lazy river? Like I think it's Louisiana State University literally used money from student funds to put in a lazy river on campus in the shapes of LSU. Great, cool. How is that advancing, you know, this this academic educational institution? It can be fun, it can be cool, like there's nothing wrong with going and having the college experience, but when all of a sudden that gets prioritized both by the university in the way that they advertise and where they put their money, but then also prioritized then by students, which I experienced um, not only just in my peers trying to make connections on campus and really struggling because I wanted to have a balance and do my schoolwork but still make friends whereas I had roommates you know staying up until 4 a.m. goofing off and then coming home and vomiting apple flavored throw up on the ground and and there was that that kind of struggle there um to yeah yeah within my it's very specific example <laughs> that haunts me to this day um and then i saw it within my students too of really trying to you know you can't force like a student engagement but i was i was so passionate about the subject that i thought maybe would be rele relevant to them the, the topic of the class was is college worth it something that was directly applicable to their lives i told them at the beginning of the class you know you guys can just complain about college here and we'll we'll talk theory about it and we'll be rigorous about it and the it was the week before spring break and i taught the we had two discussion groups on the thursday before spring break in both classes out of 25 students the first class I had like 13 students show up and then the second class I had like six um, and so just kind of yeah I highlight my experiences there um, as Nance was saying you know check it out buy the book um, but then something that is really interesting that I that I was able to offer to this text was um, the research that I did within this cohort is we uh, would interview students every year we constructed we were put into teams and we constructed an hour-long interview instrument based on our various research uh, topics within the cohort and so I actually have some student responses uh, to some of the questions in here that <clears throat> that kind of point out on the one hand similar sentiments that I was feeling students maybe disappointment with the rigor of the education as well as contradictions that we see within students perceptions and experiences and thoughts of the university and campus life for example students on the one hand saying oh yeah I don't like corporate hustle culture I it does not those types of jobs lead to unfulfilling lives those types of jobs you know people don't want them people want to have the freedom to do pursue jobs that are meaningful and then in the same interview the same student says oh yeah when it comes to a first job I would you know put my own personal ethics aside because I need the job oh <laughs> kitty cats getting Ryan's some water yeah he's trying to get <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah he loves water um yeah and so student responses such as that are students literally admitting to us yeah i guess i'm here to get this piece of paper that says i'm qualified to to work um and i think that's a really interesting perspective to not only hear it from us 
you know, people who are who are critical of the university or who have our theoretical basis, but to hear these responses from students. Um, and so I will now go ahead and read my conclusion to this piece after summarizing a little bit of of what I what I put in here, some of the perspectives and, and experiences that I got at the university. And my conclusion is liberal arts, humanities, and truth seeking as the antidote. I have not given up all hope of the idea of the university. After all I experienced at my university, you would think that I would be completely done with the system. But at the time of writing this paper, I plan on returning to the same school to work towards a master's degree. Why would I subject myself to a lifetime of debt for a neoliberalized and vocationalized experience? Partly because at this point, I know how to game the system, I know which professors to go to, and I know how to self-start and make the most out of what is being offered. But I also believe in higher education and always will. So long as there are individuals who choose to attend the university to pursue truth and knowledge and professors there to teach it, the idea of the university will be alive. I believe that prioritizing the liberal arts and humanities within the university would make a lot of this better. Students' minds and imaginations would be opened to the big ideas of life that give it meaning. To quote a line from the 1989 film Dead Poets Society, Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. Jaspers agrees that the university should teach truth and knowledge as well as practical skills for a career, but the university should prioritize the community of truth seekers, one which needs philosophy, history, social science, and the arts at the heart of it. The university has the potential to be something great, to be the hub where dialogue can thrive and we can better ourselves and our minds. Unfortunately, I don't see the university fundamentally changing within my lifetime. We would need to live in a completely different society or world, one in which human lives are prioritized and cherished more than the pursuit of capital, where there exists no working class because everyone ti everyone's time energy is more freed up to pursue their passions and build relationships. Until then, most of us will be left to work 40 plus hour hours a week and barely scrape by as the cost of living gets higher, the culture war becomes crazier, and the climate catastrophe looms over our heads. You can't blame people for not having the time and energy, or time energy, to read philosophy on the weekends, nor can you blame college students for thinking they need to pursue a practical degree to have a good life. But just because any individual is not to blame for the system doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to actively choose life, to choose our own life. We can fight the attention economy and make the effort to fill our free time with creativity or learning rather than mindlessly scrolling or binging TV shows. While in school, whether it be middle school, high school, or college, we can take our education seriously, do the readings, engage with professors, and pursue the life of the mind to grow as a thinker and a person. We can seek out communities of people that are also actively seeking to make their lives better by studying or practicing the arts and humanities, who are choosing their life and choosing to truly live. I believe Theory Underground is one of those communities, and I am proud to be pursuing education, theory, and philosophy with Dave and other fellow travelers. By examining and analyzing the neoliberal university, we can understand the ways it has strayed from Jasper's ideal university. While we might not be able to fundamentally change the university, or the values of our capitalist society for that matter, we can use our studies to theorize better ways to live our own lives, ways that embrace and pursue the liberal arts and humanities, that value knowledge, education, discourse, and truth. And by making our own lives better and choosing to put in the work, we build the foundations for future generations to reclaim their lives and time energy and put some pressure on the academic institutions and systems, showing them that this is what we truly want. And so in the spirit of, of freedom, something that Dave and I have been really theorizing and talking about lately is this idea of, of choosing your life, of, of choosing your freedom or trying to take claim to whatever freedom you are offered within this society and actively making choices and actively choosing to engage with your education, actively choosing to put yourself in connection and re in relationships with people who are bettering their lives and people who are not in self-destructive modes and cycles. And so I say, you know, choose academic freedom, choose to take it seriously, choose the liberal arts and humanities, because I think that's what makes life worth living, both within and without, inside and outside the university. And so, like Nan said, check out the piece in Underground Theory. Um, and thank you for your time and for this.
All right. The uh, time constraints here are um, not directly of my own making, but are also in part the fault of my um, desire. No, this is drive. I don't know. To get the equipment in such and such a way. And so um, I'm going to cut off of my piece a bit so that we can have a bit more of a panel discussion because I really want to have that before we close out. I really want Mikey and uh, Matt and Cadell, uh, who are in the on the Zoom side, to be able to ask questions and, and, and share some of their thoughts. And I really want the people who are on the YouTube side to be able to bring up questions as well. Um, there were some, there's been some good stuff in the live chat, and so thank you, folks. Um, in fact, one of the things that somebody said, let's see. Weird Solowski said that the order of speakers and their topics is perfect so far. And uh, Christopher said he really loved Anne's piece and lecture, and so did Pronia, which is, I believe, Maryland, so that's awesome. Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, I guess... There's like a lot of things that I wanted to say, and I'm going to get a little creative here. Um, I'm thinking, I can't set that up like that. I wish I had like a, a podium. Fucking schools, dude. Like they used to just have a podium. Now they have fucking everything, but no podium. It's bullshit. Okay. So freedom, whether to suspend it or not. Um, I just like putting things in quotes uh, because it, 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 it tells somebody, yes, I'm using this word, but I uh, don't assume too much about how I'm using it. I'm keeping it open for question. And, and this word in, in America, obviously, tends to take on these sort of laissez-faire, individualistic um, connotations. But I think those matter. And I think that the libertarian impulse in the United States is actually something to be preserved, to, something to be honored, dignified, and preserved. Sublated into something higher, something better, blah, blah, blah. But the basic idea is that that was a, a, um, a big step forward for humanity in some senses, and then it also ushered in the, the, a lot of terrible, terrible, world-destroying things. Um, but when I think of freedom, I think of freedom, I mean, in this sort of libertarian register, I'm thinking freedom to do what I want with my time and energy, um, freedom to do, to have the fruit of my labor, right? That is, sounds like an anarchist or Marxist idea, but it actually comes from John Locke, and John Locke was a liberal. He's the, one of the main thinkers of liberalism. And so obviously anarchism and, and, and Marxism, as you know, these strong traditions on the left, develop a critique of that laissez-faire individualistic sort of freedom because when everybody's pursuing it, the invisible hand of the market doesn't just elevate everything for everybody. Yes, commodities sometimes get cheaper in some ways, but inevitably they come back, the tendency for the rate of profit or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of different ideas about that. And there's debates in the field and I don't give a shit. The point is, is that, uh, yeah, I have limited time and energy on this planet. Um, if I choose to do something with that, like build a sandcastle, some other kid shouldn't be able to walk over and go, well, fuck your sandcastle, I'm going to kick it over, right? Like, fuck that kid, that's my sandcastle, right? Oh, well, that's the idea of property. We have a problem with property, right? Come here, buddy. He wants to go everywhere right now. I think he's hungry, which is, don't worry, bud, you'll have food really soon. He was going to eat Ann's rice, which I was like, go for it, man. Um, Nance will take him. This is Ryan Gosling, by the way. That's his name. He is our kitty. He's about four months old, and he's been on this whole tour with us, and he really steals the show everywhere he goes. So property. Obviously, most uh, people with any sort of a basis in the world of leftist politics understand that there's like this distinction between property as capital and property as personal belongings, right? Um, Considering the fact that all of us in our own ways go way out of our way to avoid using words that will be taken in the wrong way by normies or people who are not junkies for the things that we're into, um, like Todd, for instance, using enjoyment instead of jouissance, right? Very controversial move on his part, uh, apparently, according to the interview earlier today. But 
that you know we 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 all do this in our own ways. We all have like some way of talking about things that's meant to like not send red flags that ne- that burn bridges and alienate us unnecessarily. Um, or and part of the reason is because in the world of theory, there's a lot of people doing the opposite. All they do is run around throwing up red flags that obviously freaks people out. And I use red flag here in the double entendre sense because it is a red flag in the sense of like, oh, that's a red flag. But it's also like, oh, it's commie speak from 150 years ago. Very clever. Hmm, how original, you know. And so if we are to avoid using words that unnecessarily make our point get lost, then this idea of property and abolish property becomes problematic because when people think of property, they think of their signs that say private property, which is obviously about their personal belongings. And there's, this gets blurry because of the real estate market, right? So is it personal belonging or is it actually your belonging? Like, it, like you're, are you living there? Or is it a personal belonging that is ultimately going to be liquefied? Is it fungible? Is it a place where you're actually putting down roots or not? Does that matter? Um, these are problems for me because I don't want to get uh, stuck on some kind of a, a vision of a future that is unattainable and or that creates more problems for itself and the attainment of, a, of the kind of future that we want to move into. And... On the one side, uh, saying abolish private property um, sends the wrong signal. But on the other side, saying that people like have a right to put roots down also creates problems because as soon as you've put roots down, obviously that excludes. And now, how mu- how many roots can you put down, and how many people can put down roots, and then are, are other people actually allowed in, and are other people going to have to move because you're doing this? Um, these are all important questions, but the core insight there that I think needs to be sublated from John Locke is the idea that if you go out and you pick some apples, they're yours because you expended the labor on them, right? And so he thinks in terms of labor, and then Marx comes along and says, yeah, there's labor, but there's also labor power, which is like this commodity on the market, right? And labor power is your capacity to labor. It's not necessarily actualized labor. It's potential. And so that's important. Engels thought it was like the most important thing that came out of uh, Marx's mature thought. I think he talks about that in like the f- preface to Capital Volume 1 or something like that. Might have been Capital Vol- Volume 2, I'm not really sure. But Engels says, oh yeah, now that's like really, really important. And I mean, at, at a certain level, it is important because people think, oh yeah, look at me. I'm sitting here at the coffee shop, an employee, a barista, but I'm not actually working right now. I'm cheating. I'm sitting here cheating because no one came in for an hour and I got to dick off. Or if you're like a construction worker or like a roadside worker, you know, you're building the freeway. Um, You know, you've probably seen them sitting around sometimes, right? There's jokes. That's your government, that's your taxpayer dollars at work, right? Well, yeah, but that's the thing. It's not their labor that is being purchased. It's their capacity to labor. It's not the action of labor, but the being on standby, being on call. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trading away. Is not the act itself, but the potential to do that act and basically being like, yes, you say it, I'll hop to it, I'll get it done. You, you think, okay, well, this is great though. I, I've spent an hour or two uh, not having to work, I'm getting paid. Yeah, but you are working because you can't do what you want. That's important. And it's important to point this out. And it's important for workers to realize this because otherwise we're deluded. We think, like for instance, hey, you can go home early today. And you think, yeah, cool. Of course, I'm not going to make as much money. Of course, I'm going to have to blah, blah, blah. Um, you're, you're kinda, but at least you get to go home earlier. Maybe you still have a little energy in you, so you want to go do something. Maybe you just have a video game or Netflix series you're binging, or maybe you have loved ones in your life. That'd be cool. But you're not lucky when they send you home early in this case. Because the point is, is that that wasn't your decision. That was not something you chose. And it was not a reliable, repeatable kind of time. 
And so that kind of brings us to time energy. And I'm not really going to read from it. I'm just going to wave it around here. But this is an old draft of my book, Time Energy. And uh, the newer version has a better, well, it's basically the same cover, but it has like uh, the sort of glitch effect on the words. And then it, the, the subtitle is Why You Have No Time in it or Energy. And I thought that would be important to do because otherwise it's just like time energy. That leaves too much to the imagination. I wanted the subtitle to do a little bit more, a little bit more work. And so the person will think, oh, yeah, that's right. I don't have any time or energy. And if they go, well, I do. I had the time and energy to read the cover. Well, the point is, is later in the week when someone's saying, by the way, we're all going to go do this thing, that person's going to go, oh, sorry, I don't have any time or energy. And then you're like, oh, wait, that fucking book, man, right? And so th the idea is when we say this, and we do say this, and we say it all the time, to think of this book. And then obviously, th it's not the book itself, it's the concept. And it's also, it's not the concept, it's the phenomenon, right? Because the concept is not something that I constructed. Um, the neologism was constructed. But the signified in this case has a real world referent, and it is your life force. And you can't do anything without it. And so everyone's used the term, and so I, I thought I would really do, in order to just wrap this all up, is just to say uh, the definition of time energy and how I think it relates to freedom, limitation versus unlimitedness and then call it off at that point. And so time energy is roughly large energy-infused repeatable blocks or windows of time throughout your week. And I focus on the week because that is the battleground within which we wage war every day for our existence. If we want to have relationships, if we want to develop skill sets, if we want to go places and have fun um, or even challenge ourselves to do things that bring us outside of the simple binarism between uh, productivity and consumerism, then we need time energy. Because if you do not have large, repeatable, energy-infused blocks of time in your week, there's no way that you're going to be able to learn multiple languages, which means that you cannot actually travel, which means you cannot actually experience the world as anything other than a mere consumer tourist. Right? Because you're a fucking tourist if you go to places in the world and take pictures of things and blah, 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 blah. But you can't actually speak the language. You can't actually connect with people. If we had a real education system, you would be speaking multiple languages before you were 12 years old. And then by the time you were 14, you would actually go and immerse yourself in some other culture somewhere. Right? You would have those kinds of opportunities. And those are opportunities that are currently hoarded for Bloomberg's children, for Bezos's children, for Musk's kid. I-3-6-5-X-X-9 or whatever the fuck that kid's name is. Poor fucker. Poor kid. But time energy is not this um, sort of uh, abstract, linear, unlimited kind of point time, as byung Chul Han calls it, but Heidegger would call it present time, now time, right? It's this sort of fragmented thing that has nothing to do with other people, it has nothing to do with your own life routines. It has nothing to do with communal or personal goals or uh, meaningful r sort of rituals or events. No, it's, um, it's been chopped up into the smallest pieces possible and made exchangeable and fungible with all other kinds of time in a completely flattened way so that it can be uh, put or valorized, right? Put towards the, the, the valorization of capital. And that is because time energy gets fractured, it gets ruptured, it gets torn asunder, and it gets reduced in its reduction to labor power, which is not necessarily only the commodity, but can also be um, the thing that is on call because you are a slave or a serf, right? So uh, I am trans-historicizing the concept of, of labor power a little bit, and I am saying that Labor power is how it appears from the standpoint of the ruler, but from the standpoint of the ruled, from the standpoint of the worker, the serf, the slave, your labor power, it's not really yours. If it was, if it was yours, if it was time energy and it was yours, it would be creative power. It would be cooperative power. It would be things that you can go do outside of market, profit, or power growing um, pressures and demands. And really... 
it's the precondition for leisure time. And leisure time is that kind of time that is rich and energy infused, that is not in reference to a clock, that doesn't have like high stakes, uh, or at least like you're not starving to death, right? Um, this was called otium by the Greeks, and it was called, it was also called skole. Was it otium was the Roman one? I think Otium was the Roman one, and that Skole is the Greek one. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, the, the, the Romans get their sense of the value of this from the Greeks, and it's something that Nietzsche was very self-conscious about, his problem with socialism, his problem with leftism, the levelers, the anarchists, etc., the workers' movements in general, was that he saw that as something that would foreclose his possibility for having Otium, leisure time, right? Um, a handful of beautiful souls have to be able to read books and think. And if they can't do it, then nobody can. And that was true during his time. And that, in a sort of sense, justifies all kinds of evil things. But now we have robots. And so we don't really have to have this conversation. We could automate most of the demeaning kinds of work and we could redistribute the rest of them if people get time energy conscious or time energy pilled, as we say it on the internet. So... That's the time energy idea, is that, well, that thing that is a precondition, time energy, precondition for labor power is also the precondition for Skolle or, or Otium. And Skolle has that academic sort of school connotation, right? And that means that it's not just the time to sit around and chill because you'd get bored doing that. In fact, you would do what all gentlemen throughout history have done because it always came from free men because everybody was everybody else was subjugated uh, so that they could have this little bubble of privilege. But the point is, is that with that bubble of privilege, what they do is usually the liberal arts. They liberate themselves from drudgery, not just for, through removing themselves from toil or constant preoccupation with necessity, but also, and more importantly, through the development, the cultivation of their souls, through the cultivation of their minds, through living not just in the life of the mind in this sort of like, oh, it's just poetry or whatever. Yeah, maybe, but also science and math and philosophy and theory. and um, These things that are currently seen as like what? It's like a major that you pursue and then, then and if you do that, then everyone else will blame you for your poverty for the rest of your life, right? Like that's... Uh, free people used to just do all of those things. They didn't have to make a choice. They didn't have to major in one of them. Like Descartes didn't major in science, right? Like uh, Francis Bacon did not major in science. Um, it's, it's a silly idea. Um, and people nowadays, they, they think, well, what would I really do if I only had a three-day three work week? Or if I only had to work three hours a day? Or if I only had to work 22,000 hours in a lifetime? in order to have my basic needs met, which is Andre Gorz's idea. Or I think he gets that from someone else, but he talks about it in Paths to Paradise. Um, but the radical imaginations haven't been turned on yet by the term time energy, first of all. And second of all, their horizons of possibility have already been stultified, already foreclosed, already rendered obsolete. They do not see any real plausible way forward in which they would be able to be literate about X, Y, and Z topics that everybody is supposed to be knowledgeable about. And so instead, they just kind of cite their favorite influencer and go about their day, right? I'm a consumer who goes and listens to musicians, but I do not play in any bands myself, right? That is the model under which we all live. Time energy is supposed to make you dissatisfied with that model. And that's why I think it's important. But for now, um, I'll just say that Time energy means nothing if you do not make decisions, if you do not commit, if you do not take a resolute stance on your own possibilities. And those possibilities, if you're doing those things with other people, then that requires commitments from other people. So we've all committed to being here now and doing this thing in cooperation, but that meant that we aren't doing other things. That means that we have self-limited ourselves to this space in this time. Productive force of time energy, right? So right now, what we have is work limiting. What we want is self-limiting. And that's how 
I think I can kind of tie all these threads together. So there you go. That's it. Uh, we have time for like a couple questions, but Todd's going to have to run in a second here. So let's let him go first. Um, Nancy's going to turn the camera so that we can all sit here on the panel and uh, we'll go from there. Um, Mikey, Christopher, Matt, Cadell, do any one of you have a question to get us started here? I do. Cool. Mikey's got a question. Okay. okay. So, 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 Todd, the, the thing I'm curious about is how you connect uh, this, this concept of freedom as limit that you're getting from German idealism. And, and how did it relate to, uh, how does it relate to the ethics of psychoanalysis in uh, your view? Basically, or just in general, how, how do you see it uh, working in relation to psychoanalysis? Should I go over there? We've got this microphone okay. for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can just kind of hold it like that yeah. if you're a you rock star. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. So, yeah, it's a great question. So, I would say it's exactly aligned, right? Like, it's because what you, the whole point of our unconscious desire is that it's, it's forging a limit for ourselves. So, I think in a way, this idea of, of, self-limiting would be just paying attention to the way your unconscious desire is structured right so I don't, I'm not sure that it's different than that like I don't think I, I, I think that the it's not necessarily even choosing a I mean okay sometimes it can be choosing a conscious limit but it can also be just being paying attention to the way to the to the obstacle that you have created for yourself unconsciously and and finding your freedom in that so i don't think i think it's it's a good question because those two things do in my mind align pretty nicely and see because you know when we when i asked you a couple weeks ago about how you how you would if you did your version uh, because, because we know, okay, the ethics of psychoanalysis, Lacanians will debate what, like what the ethic actually is, but I really like your interpretation of it, which is, it's kind of a resolute embrace of the fact that you, you're, you are lacking, that you will never be complete, um, and to me, that, that seems, if I embrace my constitutive lack, that seems to also be an embrace of my constitutive limit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, that's why okay. I think they okay. coincide. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. Matt. Oh, you're muted. I said thank you to all the speakers and your enthusiasm. I have a technical question, a clarification for, for, from Todd's uh, article. <clears throat> uh, you say, Todd, on page 368, alienation into otherness, and then you quote Hegel, to be at home with oneself in one's other. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit for me, please? please? Yeah, so... The other, for, the otherness of ourselves. The otherness. <laughs> Right. So for Hegel, alienation is always, uh, it's, it's aligned with freedom, right? Like, so for Hegel, it's not like you're alienated and then you lose your, you lose yourself. It's you're alienated into to discover yourself. So that's the, that's the idea that, that, that there's a, this, in Hegel, there's real coincidence between the, our, our freedom and our and fremdung, our alienation. And so without that alienation, so that alienation is when we, that, that moment of, I, I feel like, oh, I'm lost in the other. Well, for Hegel, he would say, that's the moment of when you discover your freedom, right? Like you, it's not, it's not when you feel it. I mean, it's a very, it's an interesting, I think, opposition. Dave mentioned Heidegger briefly. Like it's a, it's an interesting opposition between Hegel and Heidegger, I think. I think for Heidegger, it's, <coughs> feeling at home is really important. I think for Hegel, not feeling at home is really important. Like that, that freedom is always, in a sense, on the road. Like it's always, it's always being, losing oneself into the, 
into otherness, right? So that that's what I that's what I would say. So is that otherness, otherness tied, tied to our, to our <coughs> sense of lack? lack? Yeah, absolutely. Like if we didn't, if we weren't a lacking subject, we wouldn't. The, 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 the person that doesn't avow their lack has no conception of this lot losing itself into otherness, right? So I think it's, I think those two things are the same. It, it keeps it coming up in so many places. places and uh, uh, yeah, I've been, I've, been, I've been trying to, trying to embrace that. It's not easy, but uh, it's, it feels liberating. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, so, Go ahead and raise your hands in the Zoom chat if you've got a, a, any more questions. I, if we don't see any within the next few minutes, we'll probably close this thing out sooner. Um, but I wanted to also ask you all if any of you have questions for one another, me, Todd, Ann, and Nance. I don't, know if, I don't know if it's a question. I do think it's interesting. Um, I think capital... Um, has kind of come up with this new requirement of uh, categorization, and I think that is is maybe a form of like artificial mm -hmm. limiting. Um, and I just wonder. Maybe I maybe I don't want to. Maybe I am. It is just commenting on the fact that that um, this fact that everything has to be labeled and and hyper categorized down to the the most minute detail. Um, stands in for our inability to self-limit. Right. I, I, I think that's really good. Yeah, I think yeah. that's exactly right. And I think that we're constantly, in the university, there's constant bombardment with like new limits, new categorization. This other, the other thing they're in love with is assessment, which is a way of kind of limiting. I think it's good. I would ask, I wanted to ask you a question about this uh, poor white trash thing, because I often use that term in reference to my origins. and. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, like you said, as a kind of identity for me, or what? Uh, do you think that does function as a? Is it like another identity category for people? And then, is it? Is there a kind of? You even might have said this. Is a kind of solace <laughs> in it? And and what? What I wonder if you, if you could think about that. What psychically is the source of the solace? Because I've wondered that myself. Like I, I kind of, like of course it's not a source of pride. It's a source of kind of. And like I'll joke about. Oh, my relatives, they used to, they used to live to the, near the river and they would move the trailer up when the river got high and they were so, they were so, and they were like married to their cousins. Uh, so, but I, I kind of, like, my kids laugh at that, but I, there's a kind of like, I don't know, I, I'm just wondering what you think psychically the appeal of that kind of discussion is. I, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely, um, some juice sauce. Um, <laughs> as, we, um, as we've been saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it's it's like the self-deprecating humor. It, it's yeah. like uh, like I um, I know that there's something about me that may be perceived as um, not up to snuff. And I think at, when I was younger, I really did um, think there was something wrong with me, and so I kind of did develop this. You know, I would outwardly project that as a self-protective measure, and now I, I think I'm more aware of it. But there's still something going on there. Um, so you think it's self, kind of self-protection? I think I think so. Yeah, um, and a way to enjoy because I really would like to have had a peaceful, calm life. We moved every nine months and yeah. upheaval, and um, yeah, you know, I yeah. Yeah, that's good. It looks like Cadell has his ra hand raised, so I guess go ahead, Cadell. Can everyone hear me? Hear me? Yes. yes, sir. I would love to engage in the uh, the jouissance of white trash, but uh, I do have a question for for Dave around around uh, commitment and time energy, and how new is that? Uh, in, uh, your, in theory? your theory, and, and does it, it um, privilege, privilege time, time or energy, energy in the way you're thinking about time, time and energy? energy. Thanks, Goodell. Um, Nance, is there a way that this camera can actually get all of us? I keep moving things around, and I can't seem to get us all in the frame. Goodell, that's, uh, so com 
So, so the question is, uh, how new is commitment um, in time energy theory? And was there another part as of that generating, question? As generating time energy. As generating time energy. Um, this has been, I don't know that I see, I, I talk about it at the end of Waypoint when I talk about uh, fusing relative and fractured time and energy that you free up in the week back into something that's repeatable and useful. Like that's an uphill battle for us, right? If you just don't have your scolae and your odium already, if you've not been habituated to being a creature of leisure, um, then when you free up time and energy, that's that goes right back into chores, goes right back into errands, it goes back into unpaid necessary labor. And so I really like how Andre Gorzin Paths to Paradise talks about how the you know the the mother working two jobs like you, she, if her work week gets a little shorter or the you know the day gets a little shorter um, it gets swallowed right back up by all of the busy work preoccupation with necessary labor that she has to do that go that is just not paid at all and I think that's a really good point um, but at the end of Waypoint I talk about in this fusing back together process the, of, of relative time and energy. Um, power, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's something about promise. Uh, there's, I use a bunch of P words and I can't really remember what they all are. But the, the idea is like there, there, there has to be, um, like you actually have to have a, a, a sense of purpose Oh, and passion was another one of those words. So you have to have time to, to have explored interests. Then you have to make decisions to commit to certain interests. You go deeper into those interests, and then that becomes a passion, right? But you only get an interest to become a passion through sacrifice, right? And 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 then that that passionate blaze can like overtake you, and and uh, and so purpose. And and and, uh, and 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 what's the other fucking word I just use? Passion. Yeah. Um, these have something to do with commitment, and I talk about it there. And I've been thinking about it a lot uh, how deadlines actually give me energy. Um, I don't know that that's true for everyone. This is a really interesting problem. I don't. I think a lot of times deadlines just overcome us and make us exhausted. Uh, there are kinds of deadlines, and I think it has deadlines to do as, deadlines, I, deadlines as self-limitation. Self right, and so that's right. I think that it's, if it's all work deadlines, then that's different than when it's like self-limitation deadlines, right? And so this is kind of this gets to the difference then between doing something because your job's telling you to, and doing it because you love to, or doing it with people who you love doing it with, right? So then the, the last time I was kind of really actually theorizing this was, uh, so for those who don't know, Anne and I, at our wedding, we had a three days of events out in the Tillamook Forest. We did it far away from where everyone else lives. We wanted people to have to sacrifice to actually be there. And we wanted them to be away from the cell phone service. And they wanted, we wanted them to be committed to, the, to us. We, we don't want people who are just... Oh yeah, sure. I'll pop into the church or what, or the courthouse or whatever. Um, and we didn't want it to be convenient for one family as opposed to the other family. We wanted everyone to come out and camp with us and have a good time. It's also just like our favorite place. We weren't like we're gonna make everyone drive really far. I know. I'm making it sound so like <laughs> so like intentional. Evil. Yeah. We're just like we love this place. Let's get married here. But there was this idea that, like, yeah, yeah we yeah, want yeah. people to come away from where they're normally at and really kind of be here. And so the people who couldn't because they had to work and they didn't have money or whatever, like, you know, it sucks. But the fact is, is if we had done the wedding in the standard way, then it wouldn't have really been a wedding in any sort of meaningful way. And then the whole thing would have been fucked anyways. So um, the three-day event, though, uh, it, was, it was actually three events over the three days. And the first was a mini philosophy conference because I'm a philosophy person. And then the next night was a talent show because Anne is a theater kind of drama person. I don't want to call her a theater kid because she's not. <laughs> um, there's a big difference there. But, you know, she's got a lot of talent in that way. And so... A lot of people played music or did poetry or did comedy or whatever. It was a lot of fun. But on the first, and then obviously on the third day, it was just the, the actual occasion. But on the first night, uh, I was the keynote speaker. I didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked for like an hour and a half. Uh, but I talked about marriage and I talked about it um, 
as like a tradition that is questionable. And uh, there's a variety of reasons for why it's questionable. I mean, Elton LK of the Working Class Intelligentsia had presented at this mini conference on Angles and the family. And so he historicized it in that way. And basically, I've gone through various phases in my development, and these phases have all been. Uh, uh, I'm convinced of certain operating assumptions and then that changes the way I live in the world. And one thing that I was convinced of for a while was that uh, monogamy is bad and that marriage was only ever about trading chattel um, or about, you know, whatever. The, the whole thing, You've all, everyone's already heard it. And I was, I was definitely a true believer in this regard and I don't think that that's all bullshit. I think that there's something to it. But um, I think that uh, my critique of polyamory, especially, uh, that I developed um, in that talk and that I've been developing for years, probably the last five years, ever since I kind of realized I'm in love and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, I want to cut myself short here, but I'm just saying that the major theme of that whole talk is commitment itself and time energy and how if you're not really committing to really being there for one person, then you're really not going to be able to be there for anybody. Um, and that there, that we actually have to make these kinds of decisions. And you could potentially still do that if you're polyamorous, if you had all your time, energy, and everyone else involved did as well. And there's a whole question there. But uh, in a world where we barely have any at all, and it's already hard enough to develop any sort of sustained relationships with other people, we have to make decisions. And commitment to any one possibility is necessarily exclusion of everything else, right? Um, and so this, this idea of uh, unlimited options being overwhelming and actually not freedom was something I wasn't even thinking about at the time. But then in the interview today with Todd, it really clicked for me. And so then that's why I said I think it's time energy is actually ge generated by commitments. And um, yeah, so there, there's a way that this is all coming together. But it was most – what's that? Involvements. Involvements, Yeah. <laughs> And so I think I think yeah that's that's basically it, man. Cool. Now it looks like Christopher has his hand raised. Go for it, man. Hello, my Hello. question's Hello. actually for Anne. Uh, I was reading her piece and then listening to it uh, during this talk. And what advice would you give somebody? Because I'm in school right now and going from like a theory underground class where like people like Nance, Dave, you, and everybody who's diving into 12 hour streams and reading all these books and stuff to like my professor referring to like anthropologists as anthro dudes and then apologizing that we have to like read little blurbs and stuff like what would you recommend to survive if you like have to grind out that degree yeah i think my kind of like very practical advice that i would just give to anyone who's like not really into theory or philosophy or like knows what theory underground is all about is don't put in too much effort into the classes that aren't putting effort into you i don't i am like strongly against the like c's get degrees mindset but figure out what your priorities are and whatever that is like whether it's writing lists or having a calendar or whatever um that's like the big thing um finding place like places on campus um that you like to study changing up your study spots like not just always being at home or always being in one spot that's kind of like my oh you're new to college but in thinking about advice that i would give to someone like you who i know is is really into it is yeah there's going to be classes like that where your professor is calling some like anthropologists anthro dudes but there are like actual professors like use the like yeah the university costs an arm and a leg might as well take advantage of it as much as possible like reach out to professors i'm sure professors do not get a lot of students knocking on their door or showing up to their office hours anymore and so maybe it'll add a little bit to your plate but maybe that's what you're looking for is going and saying what other readings do you recommend um can we talk about this more in depth i think like the professors who truly embody the idea of the university will to the best of their ability 
with the time and energy constraints that they have on themselves with the just teaching classes and the bureaucracy and, and having their own lives like they will try to help you to the best extent that they they can is just what i found in my experience find like clubs and organizations to get involved in try to do some research like really just take advantage of the of the opportunity like steal stuff from campus i don't know like for real my sister i told her to take stuff from the the cafeteria and she was coming home with whole bags of bread and like fruit for the week okay i want to take shirts free shirts they like <laughs> just take advantage of what is being offered because the idea of the university and all the advantages are still they're still in there if you look in the right places so that's that's what i have to say i have thank you I have, yeah I have two things that I have to add, um, and, and one is how to get lots of money from the school to do really cool stuff, and the other one is, um, in, in terms of priori prioritizing your, your time management or whatever, um, there's something I wish I'd done that I only found out about after it was too late, and that is don't try to get A's in all your classes in the first uh, four or five weeks. Try to get a C in each of your classes in the first five weeks. And I say this only because I, I really, I mean this, that I put in so much effort to actually getting A's in classes and then I found out later in a lot of these classes, oh, everyone was getting A's the whole time and they weren't even fucking trying. So I could have been focusing on philosophy, but instead I was focusing on this photography class where I ended up getting a B anyway, even though I actually tried. And it's like the, it was just kind of a crapshoot. In that case, he really just had his favorites, and there was it was kind of arbitrary. Um, and so, if you try to get a C, not don't try to get a like a don't try to fail it the first few weeks, but just a C, a solid like average. Like if you go for that, you put in half effort or eighty percent effort. You don't go because the twenty percent effort. Or actually, hold on, sorry, I found out that that's this is fascist yeah. from uh, from Nance. The eighty twenty. The 80 20, 20 rule comes from Pareto. He was an Italian fascist. So, what I actually mean is 73% uh, of your effort <laughs> and, and, uh, should, should go into uh, each of your classes. It, because that remaining 17% uh, Is it 27? 27. That's 27. 20, that, remember, that remaining 27. 17% into math. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, <laughs> I put 17% into math. It's true. But that remaining 27%. Um, is an infinite regress and it's a time energy suck and so uh, but the other thing is is uh, start a club you don't need a lot of members to be able to still get money from the school and so if as long as you can find like two other people who care about the thing you just tell them like look this is a club yeah we'll do whatever like we care about philosophy yeah sure but also like this club what it's really about is getting money from the departments from the student government etc so that we can bring people that we want to bring to campus mm -hmm. and then you actually solicit from speakers who you're interested in whether it be Todd McGowan or Richard Boothby or uh, Cadell last you actually get hey would you come to our campus if we can get you like enough of an honorarium to pay for your flight and your uh, your per diem and if they say yes then you go to your student government and you say all right we want this money and it's the, the main thing is moving on it the moment the semester starts if not sooner if possible because uh, all that money goes away later and what it goes towards is sororities and fraternities and their pizza parties it doesn't actually go to um, lazy rivers it goes to lazy rivers it doesn't bring to bring it doesn't go to intellectual efforts and so um, people will Thank you for the rest of their lives if you do something like that. Like mine culminated in finally bringing Richard uh, Wolf to campus, and I still get people, they'll message me randomly, that was so cool, man. So it's really cool to be able to do stuff like that. Yeah. So Thank you. And I think at this point, we actually have to close out. And so I want to let the panelists do is I want everyone to like share their closing thoughts, anything they have to say, and then we say goodbye. Uh, I just want to say I really liked, Anne, your point about reading whole books, and that would be my advice. Yeah. I would say always read whole books. Like, mm. even if there's a little bit assigned, you should read the whole book. I always, I, I assign whole books all the time in my, my classes. My favorite classes, yeah, not I just, sociology, I, I just, I, you know, I, I mean, I just think it's the most important thing. Yeah, so that, that's a, I don't think that's a, that's a, that's a self-limiting thing, right? You read, it, anyway, I, I don't mm. know how it fits with yeah. what I said, but I, I do think it's really important. I think yes. it's the most important thing is to read. I mean, I even try to, 
I even read Marxist, I've read Marxist theory of surplus value. So it's a, like, it's so tedious, but yeah. I just think once you start it, you should finish it and, and don't read an excerpt. So. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone uh, for your time. Um, these events are a little scrappy, a little rough around the edges, <laughs> um, and it's it's experimental. And, and I, I love being a part of it. I love that other people love being a part of it. And I do believe um, like we're collectively figuring out something that uh, is historic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Um, thank you to the people watching now on YouTube in the future. Uh, thank you to Todd for having us here. Um, the university might cost an arm and a leg, but I'd pay it if all my professors were as enthusiastic and, and well-versed as you. And so I felt very lucky. I'm like, oh, I get a free lecture, like <laughs> taking notes like I'm in class. So just thank you so much for that and for your contribution to the anthology. I didn't want to go last. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was just checking to make sure we didn't have any final questions from the chat there. So um, to the people who are here on the live side uh, on the Zoom call, to the people who are here uh, at, on the live side of the, the YouTube live stream, to the people who are here in the future watching this on YouTube, as well as the people who are potentially watching bits and pieces of this that get cut up and put into other things a thousand years from now. Like, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, you make it possible for us to do this because if we were just talking to the wall, we'd get like, okay, what are we doing, <laughs> right? And so this is important and we really appreciate it. And Todd, it really means the world that you were able to secure this space for us. Um, this is Tour Zero. That's my reminder to everybody. It is Tour Zero. It's the tour before the tour. Um, and in that sense, it means that we're getting, we're gauging the situation. We're seeing what happens when we do virtually no marketing whatsoever. And when we just, it's like we're, we're here. What's up? Let's see what happens. And sometimes there's a room full, well, there's, sometimes there's like eight people and someone drove all the way, someone drove four hours to be at the Kansas City one. And other times, um, it's like here where it's just the virtual people. But um, the, I think something that, is going to be sticking with me for a while was I just really like the way that Andrew McLuhan put this thing yesterday, which it's, it's kind of an insight. I think everyone kind of gets at a certain level, but he found a great way of articulating it. And that is that, um, it's like, like the internet's a lot like New York. It's uh, everyone's there. Um, and, and anyone can do anything because there's so many people there. Um, but the, the, the thing is, is like the internet has made it so that he's actually able to do it from the countryside. He doesn't actually have to be in the city. The only issue then becomes attention, and how do you actually get it without selling out? He he didn't put it in those terms, but I know that's what he means because he has that punk DIY background. And so for me, it's similar. It's like I I do believe that like if you exit the university, you can still sell out by chasing the algorithm. And so I don't know at a certain level, like nobody watching, very few people watching something. It kind of it's it's street it's street cred to us it's street cred to you because we're doing it just because it matters, but also we do want to figure out a way <laughs> to get a bunch of people from the normal world in here. And so tour zero is mostly us with the internet and the possibility of people coming in the flesh. But what we're really looking forward to is doing it again and having more people because we'll actually advertise for a few months ahead of time and and all of the things that are required that we're learning about every day. So with that, thank you, each of you, for your amazing talks today. Thank Take care, you, Internet. Ryan. Yeah, what does Ryan want to say? I'm hungry. Okay, you'll close that one out. I'll close this one out. I'm a baby. Do you guys need help? No, Todd, you're good. Looking forward to reading it. Oh, thank you. I haven't got it. Hey, Dave, take care of me. Yeah, for sure. Hold on one second. Let me just... Uh, Shut down. Now let me make sure we're not recording. We are.